Now, there are some arguments about security communities, a phenomenon we'll look at later on in the semester, um, that suggest that collective identification may be sufficient to produce security communities, but it isn't necessary. That is, that you can get security communities uh, among pe people in states that don't collectively identify with another, with one another very strongly. Well, if that's the case, then, we can think about international politics as a social system in which the distribution of roles and of identities will affect the level of conflictual or cooperative behavior um, between states. Now, from here we can move to a number of key concepts in constructivist theory. I've already mentioned some of these, but we should probably elucidate them a bit. The first is the notion of social roles. We've already talked about what social roles are, but they are essentially uh, ascriptive identities uh, that have to do with function or category into which we sort people. So we have so doctor is a social role, professor is a social role, uh, husband, wife, uh, child, these are all social roles. When we think about how they play out in terms of intersubjective knowledge or intersubjective social understandings, we know that in certain societies and given times and places that we, uh, that those social roles carry certain presumptions about the character of the people who occupy them, about what kinds of authority they have and under what circumstances, under what it is appropriate for them to do or not to do. So we might think in the international system about social roles like democratic states might be a social role, or oh, members of Western civilization might be both an identity and also a social role. Members of the civilized community, to use the language that George Bush has been using uh, since September 11th, civilization versus barbarism. You might think about things like rogue states as being social roles. Rogue states as being states that, for whatever reason, don't follow uh, norms of appropriateness or norms of appropriate behavior. I've just said the same thing, but you get the point. Uh, norms of appropriate behavior that everybody else accepts, and so they become, in a sense, kind of quasi-pariah states. Or at least there's an attempt to label them as pariah states, as rogues, or in the current parlance, as states of concern. Now, when we talk about social roles, we're already talking about this notion of norms. That is, that social roles contain normative assumptions about what is appropriate to do, what the appropriate ends are, what we ought to be striving for, uh, and what the appropriate strategies are for achieving those goals. So a lot of constructivists have become interested in this distinction between what are sometimes known as logics of appropriateness and logics of consequences. Go back to what we were doing with liberalism. A lot of rational choice theory, which is fundamental to a lot of modern liberal theory, assume that actors engage in logics of consequences that they calculate their material and other rewards from engaging in current kind of strategies, and they do whatever is most efficacious to achieve those ends. And that's a logic of consequences. You're weighing the costs and benefits, the consequences of your actions. Now, logics of appropriateness may concern thinking, you know, sort of answers the following question. Okay, given who I am, what is it appropriate for me to do under the circumstances? So, if I'm a doctor, the, one of the common norms associated with being a doctor is that it's appropriate for me to save lives. So I ought to act in a way that tries to save lives. And particularly, emergency rooms have this norm called triage, which is a way of saying, okay, who do we treat first given a lot of people are injured? Well, we treat those according to the logic of appropriateness of triage who are most injured. And Jan Elster actually, uh, in his book Nuts and Bolts, talks about how from a consequential standpoint, this isn't necessarily a good idea. If you want to maximize the number of lives that were saved, you might go not for the people who are most injured or most sick, or the people who were least injured or least sick. You go sort of, sort of for people in between, because they're the people who are in danger, but you are most likely to save. People who are most sick or most injured, there's a high probability that they're going to die on you anyway. And while you're treating them, the people who are moderately uh, in trouble might get worse. And so from a sort of consequential standpoint, triage may not make that much sense. But from a, but it's, so ya Elster argues that we can see this as a norm, that is, as a logic of appropriateness for how doctors ought to behave in emergency room settings, which is then tied into the social role of being a doctor. If I'm a doctor in emergency room, how do I approach 
deciding who to treat, and triage is the norm for doing so. You might imagine a whole host of norms in international politics. Some people talk about uh, weapons taboos, and this is the notion that you might develop a social environment in which using certain kinds of weapons is normatively inappropriate, is considered morally illegitimate. So it may be the case that uh, a lot of states don't use chemical weapons anymore, even though from a consequentialist standpoint it might be a good idea, they might be more likely to win conflicts if they use chemical weapons. Uh, but they don't do so because they've come to believe it's immoral, it's illegitimate. And then when a state does use chemical weapons, say when Hussein used chemical weapons against the Kurds, it then provides evidence that he is uh, a tyrant, that he is outside the norms of appropriate behavior in international politics, that he is in essence a war criminal or Hitler-like or what have you. Now there's obviously a robust debate about whether the non-use of chemical weapons is in fact driven by norms, that is a constructivist kind of argument, or whether the non-use of chemical weapons is a factor of deterrence, that states haven't used chemical weapons because they worry about other states using chemical weapons again against them, a logic of consequence kind of reasoning. And realists tend to say that it's the deterrence issue, constructivists have tended to say it's the appropriateness or the logical appropriateness that's doing the work. Now one of the problems with evaluating these arguments, which I just want to know, is that in some respects a logic of consequences is a logic of appropriateness. Because a logic of appropriateness isn't just about values, it's about what are the appropriate means given a social role for achieving those values. So the problem here is you might think that um, for states it could be the case, or for leaders of states, it could be the case that the dominant norm is something like reason of state or raison d'etat, state interests. And that norm that says we need to preserve the state uh, and we need to, uh, even in the face of having to violate our value, other values, would then suggest that it is normally appropriate as a uh, foreign policy maker to engage in logics of consequences. So this can be very difficult to tease out in practice, but this is one of the major kinds of debates and issues that's floating around in constructivist theory and constructivist engagements with non-constructivists. The third category we've already mentioned, this is identity and identification. Now, it's a little repetitive because an identity is just a social role. Doctor, lawyer, uh, these are identities, but they're also social roles. Also Israeli, uh, Palestinian identities, but they also are social roles. But you can also think about identity as not so much the kind of who I, the question of given who I am, what should I do? You can think about identity in terms of kind of more formal properties. Collective identification, that is what we talked about earlier, who you collectively identify with may be relevant rather than so much what the basis of that identification might be. Uh, you can also think about identity formation as a process of social boundary drawing. Uh, and Charles Tilley has done some interesting work forwarding this notion that when we think about identity, we can say that identity is different from a social role because identity is simply a claim about sort of uh, who is in the in-group, or um, it's a process of developing stories about who we are that reflect social boundary conditions, that is, uh, reflect situations in which we interact much more with some people than with other people.